speaker. So this week we have a seminar and e-visit from Tomasz Kaminski, who is an assistant professor at the Nikolaus Copernicus Astronomical Center in Torun in Poland. And uh, Tomasz did his PhD at the, the Nikolaus Copernicus Center as well, and has then worked as a postdoc at Max Planck, ESO in Chile, and uh, CFA in the US before returning to Torun last year. And as you see from his title, he largely works on red novae and stellar mergers, but he's also worked on evolved stars and dust formation. And yeah, it's been a minute now, so go ahead, Thomas. Thank you very much, Sophia, for uh, uh, the introduction and uh, to anyone who was involved in inviting me to give this talk and the entire e-visit. It's a great pleasure uh, to be on a virtual visit to uh, one of the last strongholds of stellar astrophysics in Europe. I'm really uh, excited about the stuff that you do at, uh, at your institute, at the stellar astrophysics and beyond. So I wish we could meet in person, but given the circumstances, your visit is also very nice and I'm uh, really glad that we could do this. So um, I'm going to talk about stellar mergers and uh, as most of you probably, uh, most of you uh, uh, associate the, the, mer the term mergers today with uh, uh, mergers of black holes and neutron stars, which is a very a new field of astrophysics, very exciting. Uh, but the merger process itself is very well understood. It's of course related to the emission of gravitational waves. I am interested in mergers of more normal stars. And by normal stars, uh, by normal stars, I mean um, uh, uh, main sequence stars, red giants, uh, AGB stars, or, or even white dwarfs. And uh, from, uh, from textbooks, you learn that the, mer the mergers do not happen very often, so we should not be able to observe them. But we definitely uh, know or have hints that we may be observing stellar merger products. And for instance, there are groups of stars, that are those of FK comma stars, which could be only explained uh, by stellar mergers because they uh, rapidly rotate and there is no other uh, uh, there is no other mechanism or scenario uh, that uh, would explain this fast rotation. The, some of the blue stragglers you may know uh, are uh, potentially uh, stellar merger products and there is a few more other classes of objects uh, of this type. There are also like for instance our corona boreali stars uh, which are products of merger be mergers between white dwarfs. And of course, uh, you all know about supernovae 1a. But there are also individual objects where we don't understand their nature very well and then suggest that maybe they are products of stellar merger. One example is, for instance, Betelgeuse, uh, which is uh, rotating relatively fast for a red supergiant. And people think that it might have swallowed its companion some time ago. That also explains some other bizarre characteristics that uh, make it uh, not, uh, 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 not follow the uh, isochrons that uh, stellar evolution prepared for Betelgeuse. Another a very famous example is the progenitor of supernova 1987A, uh, which was a massive blue star, uh, which probably was uh, produced in a merger. And uh, since we're talking about uh, massive stars, uh, one very famous example is also Eta Carina, uh, which probably started its life as a triple system. Now it's a binary system. And in a great eruption in the 19th century, uh, which we think could have been a merger, produced this beautiful homunculus nebula. So we think that the mergers might, may happen, but uh, from those uh, cases that I just described, we don't learn much about how the merger happens. And uh, to be honest, most of those objects are so exotic that uh, probably we have only circumstantial evidence that the merger happened. The merger, if happened, uh, uh, took place thousands, millions, or even tens of millions years ago, so there is no smoking gun that would tell us it was really a merger. And, and as I told you, textbooks say we should not observe uh, stellar measures happening before our eyes, but at the beginning of this century, we realized this assumption was wrong. 
We now know that there is a class of uh, eruptive stars known as red novae, which we think are stellar mergers happening in real time. We know of five uh, galactic objects of this type, and I'm going to present you today some of them. Uh, maybe the most famous one is V3 Monocerotis with the beautiful light echo, and it was a merger in a young uh, multiple system, uh, 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 probably a triple system. But we have also cases like V4332 Sagittarii and V1309 Scorpii, which erupted in evolved binaries, uh, where uh, the components uh, of the binaries were already subgiants. There are also two cases uh, which we know a little less about. There is one that was observed towards the galactic barge, it's called BLG360. And also a very old red nova from the 17th century, CK Vulpecula. And those two objects are probably, were also probably evolved uh, in the moment of the merger, and uh, the merger involved red giants. So uh, the common characteristics for red novi is the following. I am going to present those uh, most characteristic features by showing examples of, on, of V3 monocerotis. The outbursts uh, uh, is characterized by multiple peaks. So you have the light curve shows multiple peaks at usually very high luminosity. Uh, V3 monocerotis reached a luminosity of above 10 power 6 solar luminosities. And those different peaks associ are associated with the changing radius of the pseudo photosphere of uh, Explode, exploding or ex expanding object, you can see that V3 monocerotis uh, became huge. In the uh, main peak, it was uh, larger than thousands of solar, uh, had a radius of, of uh, larger than thousands of solar radii. But maybe the most characteristic thing of V3 monocerotis and other red novae is that after the main outburst, the object cools down to very, very low temperatures and V3 monocerotis reached a temperature of 2000 Kelvin. In this very uh, cool phase, uh, those objects produce a lot of circumstellar dust and molecules. The dust obscures those objects, making them even redder. So we call them red novi because they become cool, and also they become redder because of this extra extinction. And uh, you should notice that uh, this characteristics that uh, uh, red novi evolved to very low, uh, to, uh, evolved to very low, uh, to very low temperatures. Uh, distinguishes them from most of the other eruptive uh, stars like supernovae uh, or novi, where the eruption is uh, uh, driven by thermonuclear reactions. To have thermonuclear reactions, you need very high temperatures, and sooner or later, in those explosive objects, you see this hot material being exposed. In the case of uh, red novi we don't see this, cool mat this very hot material because the entire energy of the outburst is, uh, is energetic, energetically uh, fueled by uh, accretion, which doesn't require high temperatures. So how do we know these are really stellar mergers and not something else? Uh, we, over the last 20 years, we collected a lot of evidence, but maybe the most spectacular and maybe straightforward uh, uh, explanation of red novi as uh, stellar mergers was the case of B1309 Scorpii, which erupted as a red nova in 2008. And here I am showing you a light curve that was collected by Ogle. It happens that Ogle observed this object before it erupted, years before, uh, before it erupted. And you can see this uh, green, those green points show some variability in the I band. And this is not noise, this is real variability, which shows that V1309 Scorpii was an eclipsing contact binary before uh, the Red Nova event. Uh, if you have a contact binary, you can uh, measure the period, orbital period of the system very well. And it turns out that the orbital period was changing over the years when the system evolved into a merger. This was the first time we saw two stars spiraling in into a merger. And there is actually no uh, evidence and uh, no other explanation for uh, the eruption of uh, uh, V1309 Scorpii and all the other objects share similar characteristics even though we didn't observe the uh, pre-outburst behavior so well as in the case of V1309 Scorpii. This object uh, is also, an all other red novi is also very important for us because just 
uh, before the main eruption, the object enter into the so-called common envelope phase, which is a very important uh, uh, phase in the evolution of binary systems. We don't understand why some of the binary systems uh, go through the common envelope, uh, shortening the period, uh, while others uh, don't survive the common envelope, ending in a merger. We would like to understand what are the physical processes going on during the common envelope uh, that decide on the uh, level of shrinkage of the uh, orbit of, of the orbit of the, of the systems. So, as I told you, V1309 Scorpii was an involved uh, binary. Uh, we think these were two subgiants uh, with rather complex uh, stellar evolution, and uh, uh, it's the stellar evolution that caused the merger. The tidal interaction between two stars that were changing their uh, sizes directly caused the merger. Uh, we observe red novae also in other galaxies, mostly in the local group galaxies, uh, because those objects are typically much more luminous than, uh, than novae, but not as luminous as supernovae. Uh, the sky, sky surveys that are uh, observing the almost entire sky now are discovering more and more of those objects. And even last week, uh, there were two new and third object in uh, M31 was discovered of this type. So we're very exciting because the sample is growing really fast for those extragalactic objects, showing us many different light curves. As I told you, here's, here are some uh, examples. As I told you, they typically have multiple peaks. Here I am comparing several extragalactic objects with V3 monocerotis, which is shown with the dashed curve. And you can see that uh, the magnitude and also the time span of the eruption may be different. The longest uh, transient of this type lasted three years or even slightly longer. Uh, but you can see that for most of the extragalactic object, objects, we uh, lose track of them a few hundred years after the eruption. We don't know what is left after the eruption. This is different for our galactic red novi, which we can study in great detail uh, just after uh, the eruption, and from this we can infer something about the physics of uh, stellar, stellar coalescence uh, or stellar collisions. So how, how do we extract physical information about mergers from uh, the remnants? Uh, the simulations of mergers have shown that there is a lot of circumstellar material uh, that will be the smoking gun of the uh, physical processes that are going on in those systems. Here I am showing you a simulation of a system similar to V1309 Scorpii. The top panel shows you the view from the top. The lower panel shows you the view from, uh, from the orbital plane as we observed the system in the case of V1309 Scorpii. So you can see that even before the merger happens, the system starts to lose mass, uh, that's the purple color, lose mass in the spiral pattern. This, the, the, the simulations show that there is not much mass lost. Uh, this is it's supposed to be only a few percent of the total mass of the uh, system. But the angular momentum that is being carried away by, by this mass is enormous. And actually, the effectiveness of how much the angular momentum you get rid of uh, uh, through the circumstellar material uh, will decide on whether the stars merge or not. That's why uh, I have now a project that uh, is uh, investigating uh, the remnants of galactic red novi to find those physical uh, clues about uh, merging process. So we try to measure the masses that were dispersed in those objects. We, would, we try to constrain the angular momentum in the different components of those stars, including uh, the stellar remnant, the, the, the object with the photosphere, and also the circumstellar material. And we also try to learn something about the progenitors of those systems to understand what kind of stellar evolution leads to emerging systems. And of course, this is much easier to say than do, uh, mostly because uh, the red novae that we know of are at large distances. Even though they are in our galaxies, the, uh, galaxy, they usually are at kiloparsec scale. And also uh, because they are uh, very exotic, it's very difficult sometimes to understand uh, the structure of, of those remnants and how to extract 
really relevant physical information from what we see. Uh, so to show you an example how difficult it is and how it exotic how exotic those objects are, let's start with B4332 Sagittari, which is a clone of the object I showed you a moment ago, the one observed by Ogo, V1309 Scorpion. So we expect this was a merger uh, uh, in a system involving subgiants. So this is what we see as an SCD uh, some tens of years after the eruption. Uh, we see a signature of a cool photosphere of about 3200 kelvins, and we see uh, spectral energy distribution that is typical for disks seen edge on with very strong absorption uh, uh, in the silicate band and also we see some water ice uh, uh, at three microns. Uh, the spectrum in the optical is highly unusual. You see the photosphere again uh, of a very cool giant of about 3200 kelvins. This is the blue line but on top of this continuum you see multitude of emission lines. Some of them come from neutral alkali metals, but most of them come from uh, molecular bands. Some of them are pretty exotic. For instance, chromium oxide was first discovered in this, uh, this very source. So uh, the, if you study the line profiles, you can learn something about the kinematics of this, uh, of this cool uh, gas. And it tells us that we're dealing with some disk wind or some bipolar outflow in this object. Then we can do also spectropolarimetry. And from line effect, we can even uh, guess what, what is the structure, uh, the chemical structure of, uh, of this bipolar outflow uh, that you see in the optical. So uh, here I went through those slides very quickly just to show you that you need a lot of observations, a lot of telescope time and a lot of different techniques to reconstruct uh, uh, the structure of an object that you cannot resolve uh, uh, because your res angular resolution is too poor. So in this case, all those observations that we collected over, over 10 years uh, tell us that in the center of, of V4332 Sagittari, there is a red giant or a red supergiant. It is surrounded by a very thick disk that contains a lot of dust. And we don't look at the star uh, directly, we only see its scattered light. Uh, when we look at the position of the star in, in the infrared, we see those very uh, deep absorption bands. Above the, above the disk plane and below the disk plane, we see some bipolar outflow uh, of uh, rich in very simple molecules. And if we could uh, take a picture of this object, uh, it would look like this protostar that I'm showing here in the upper uh, corner um, with a dust lane obscuring the main object and we see only this bipolar path. But this uh, reconstructed image is not very convincing to community, so we really work, worked hard to make a real image of this object. And this was possible only recently with, uh, uh, with uh, the ALMA interferometer. We needed both the uh, angular resolution and the sensitivity of this great array to be able to show how the remnant of B432 Sagittarius really looks like. And the first observations show that this is a very rich molecular source at some millimeter wavelengths. We see simple molecules like SIO and CO, but uh, some of them are pretty exotic. For instance, we definitely see aluminum oxide and maybe even aluminum hydroxide in this source. So ALMA allowed us to resolve this source. Uh, for some of you, uh, this may look like uh, uh, usual radio blobs, uh, but uh, there is a lot of information in the, uh, in the data cubes that we extracted for uh, this source. When you plug in those blobs into a radiative transfer code, uh, you can actually uh, very nicely reconstruct the three-dimensional structure uh, of the object. So here you're looking at uh, the merger remnant 20 years after the eruption. Uh, you can see bipolar structure uh, uh, with a velocity low that is well described by a linear or uh, a linear velocity field or a hub of flow like uh, uh, low. And this simple model is already pretty constraining for the physics of stellar mergers. For instance, here I am showing you a simulation of a merger uh, similar to V1309 Scorpii made by Andre Pecha. Uh, top view shows you the density, uh, lower panels show you the temperature, and on the left you see the top view and uh, the 
uh, middle panels show you the side view. So um, as I told you, the, the systems lose a lot of mass already before the merger, but this mass is mostly accumulated in the orbital plane. So seen here in blue in the moment of merger, this material is already very cool. But when the real merger happens, and the merger ejecta is more or less spherically symmetric, it starts to interact with the material accumulated in the orbital plane, deflecting the merger ejecta into bipolar nebula exactly as the one we observed in V4332 Sagittarii. The velocity field that is predicted by those simulations also uh, is consistent with what we observe in V4332 Sagittarii. So, of course, ALMA gave us also other uh, important information about this remnant. Uh, we could study the temperature structure and also uh, uh, constrain the mass of the uh, material uh, in the remnant. And it's uh, very low, 0 0.01 solar masses, which constitutes about 10 uh, percent of the mass of the binary system that merged uh, those decades ago. Uh, of course, the most interesting part of the remnant would be the inner disk, the, the structure that is in the waste in the bi of the bipolar structure. And we already attempted to observe this source with BLTI that gives us an angular resolution of about two milliseconds, uh, milli arc seconds. But unfortunately, the observations were stopped because of the pandemics, and we eagerly await uh, for Paranal to open the VLTI for observations again. Let's have a look at another uh, object. V38 Mon is very famous for its uh, 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 light echo that was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, the presence of the light echo indicates there is a lot of interstellar dust surrounding the star. We also know there is some molecular material, dense molecular material surrounding, this, uh, surrounding the vicinity of the treat monocerotes. And we observe several stars, B-type stars, that form a sparse cluster uh, just next to the treat monocerotes. All this tells us that uh, this system was very young in the time uh, of the eruption of about 10 million years. From pre-outburst observations and what we learned uh, after the observation, we know that v 38 mon was actually a multiple system. Uh, one of the stars that erupted was uh, of uh, about eight solar masses, main sequence star. It has a companion that is still there, a B-type star, rapidly rotating eight solar mass star. And the uh, the, from the energy of the outburst, we suspect that the, uh, the other star that was consumed during the 2002 eruption uh, was of a mass of about 0 0.4 solar masses. And at the age of the cluster, then it had to be a pre-main sequence star. So uh, mergers can happen not only in evolved stars as uh, uh, stellar evolution predicted for many years, they also may happen in young systems. Here is the spectrum of V38 monocerotis uh, a few years after the eruption. Actually, I'm showing spectra for two epochs. And again, as in the case of V4332 Sagittarii, we observe a photosphere that resembles a red giant or a red supergiant. Uh, in this case, we don't observe emission lines. We observe very, very deep absorption lines, mostly in molecular bands. Some of the TIO bands eat up all the flux uh, in, uh, uh, in very uh, broad uh, uh, ranges of wavelengths. So there is a very, very severe absorption uh, through circumstellar medium surrounding uh, the, the stellar remnant. Uh, actually, uh, in addition to the ejecta that uh, we think is related to the merger itself, we observe that this red giant, this fake red supergiant developed uh, stellar wind, stellar wind that is very similar to uh, uh, other cool evolved stars. And v 3 mon has even it, a SIO maser, which fortunately allowed us to measure a very precisely distance to this uh, exotic object. Uh, the stellar photosphere is also interesting because we now followed it for the uh, almost uh, 20 years. And uh, uh, it happened that several times the uh, interferometers were used to measure the, the diameter of the star. 
And as I told you, during the eruption, the star had a radius of about 3,000 solar radii. Uh, a few years later, just after the eruption, we measured that its size was of about five astronomical units, six astronomical units, but it shrank into 3.5 astronomical units uh, on a time scale of about nine years. And of course, we would like to measure it now. And we even got first uh, visibilities for this measurement, but unfortunately COVID again uh, was on our way and we were not able to make, uh, 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 well, uh, uh, make a measurement that would well constrain the size of the star. So we still have to wait for this. Uh, we also observe uh, funny effects related to the interaction of the merger ejecta with the distant companion. At some point in 2005, the merger ejecta started to approach the position of the hot star and the radiation of the star started to photoionize the merger ejecta, giving rise to nice iron, uh, uh, iron lines. Uh, we use the profiles of those iron lines to locate uh, the, the companion. At a few months later, after the flaring of iron lines, we, uh, the, uh, the blue star completely disappeared. And of course, the interpretation is that the ejecta completely obscured that uh, hot star. That's why we don't see it anymore. When we look at submillimeter wavelengths, uh, we again observe simple oxides towards V3 monocerotis. We are very happy to obtain the first detection of those molecules that allowed us to uh, observe this object at a larger interferometer. And we used ALMA in the most extended configuration at 16 kilometer baselines to uh, 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 resolve the uh, structure of the uh, merger remnant of V3 monocerotis. And this is what we see with ALMA. In colors, you see the distribution of molecular gas um, or emission of uh, molecular gas. And in contrast, I'm showing you continuum emission. So the continuum emission shows you the position of, uh, of the merger remnant, V3 monocerotis. There is another continuum peak, which is related to the companion that is now obscured by dust uh, produced during the uh, 2002 eruption. But there is a third component whose existence uh, we are not able to explain very well. Uh, it may look like that uh, it has something to do with the ejecta interacting with the uh, companion and then forming this uh, dust wave. But this is inconsistent with physics because the merger ejecta was speeding up with velocities of about uh, 200, 300 kilometers per second, whereas the orbital uh, velocity of the companion is of about one kilometers per second. So from the boily hoyle accretion uh, criterion, there is no way that there is considerable interaction between the merger ejecta and the companion, at least not uh, dynamical interaction. So uh, what is it? Uh, some of the uh, simula simulations of mergers do predict formation of asymmetric ejecta. For instance, here I am showing you a simulation of Ivanova and Nandes showing some kind of stream or jet being formed during the merger. It, it may be related to the plunge in phase, the moment when one of the stars smash, uh, smashes into another. But we think that maybe in V3 monocerotis, this is not the case. This, there may be some chemical effect that we observe. Uh, we observe SIO gas emission from the same region, which has a strange distribution. It seems here you have a 3D reconstruction of the SIO uh, uh, gas. It seems to have a hole. Uh, there is some SIO missing exactly in the place where we observe emission from dust. So we think that maybe uh, there is some chemical effect that makes SIO depleted and form eff uh, more effectively dust, that uh, silicate dust that we observe at submillimeter wavelengths. But this is still a pre preliminary result and we're trying to figure out what, what is going on. Uh, as I told you, uh, we are really working hard to learn more about what is going on in the very center of the remnant. We would like to investigate whether uh, there is a, a disk uh, storing angular momentum of the binary system that existed there, but so far uh, we were not able to uh, get enough VLTI time to do this properly. So stay tuned. Uh, the last object I would like to tell you about is uh, the oldest one we know of, Nova 1670, which was 
uh, observed by European observers in the 17th century. Uh, most devoted observer of the subject was uh, Jan Haverius from Danzig, who, uh, allow, wh whose observations allowed us to reconstruct the light curve. And you can see at least three peaks that uh, were uh, observed uh, on a time span of over two years. Uh, we see red novi transients of similar characteristics. But Hevelius likely also left a note that during the eruption, Nova 1670 was pretty red. That, uh, that is the basis on which we speculated that CK wool is one of the red nova kind. So the object was forgotten for many centuries. All, only in the 80s, people found a weak nebula at the expected position of the object observed by Hevelius. Uh, but not expecting much, when I worked at the Apex Telescope, I directed it in the dead time uh, to this object, and I found a very strong molecular emission uh, only after five minutes of integrations. And then I we repeated observations uh, with Apex Telescope and Iron 30 meter at many different uh, frequency ranges, and we see molecular emission everywhere. It's a very rich source of molecular emission, uh, there, is only a few, there are only a few stars, evolved stars, that would have a compari co comparably complex spectrum. Uh, the spectrum is complex because there is a lot of different molecules uh, that exist in this, uh, in this remnant. Uh, here you see the list that we came up with so far. There are simple, uh, simple molecules, but even very complex ones, uh, consisting even of seven atoms and including species like methanol. This list of molecules is also very bizarre because it combines molecules that are typically observed only in carbon stars and those that are observed only in oxygen-rich stars. For instance, SO2 is observed only in oxygen-rich stars, and then in those objects you don't expect to observe CCH or HC3N, whereas in CK wool you observe uh, a combination of those objects. Our analysis shows that uh, there is a strange uh, CNO uh, uh, ratio, so uh, ratios of the uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. It seems that in this object, the most abundant of, this, of the three elements is actually nitrogen. So uh, here I'm showing you the structure of the remnant as we uh, see it today. The blue nebula shows you uh, uh, the atomic emission. So it's uh, recombining hydrogen. And you can see that in orange, the region where we observed molecules, you can see that the position angle of that bipolar molecular nebula is different than the, uh, uh, than the large hourglass structure. So uh, there must have been change in the orientation of the outflows in this object. And the question is whether it occurred during the merger or after the merger. So to investigate the structure uh, of the remnant, we uh, again used ALMA to map uh, almost every uh, molecule that we know of in the source. And here are some uh, results. You can see a large variety of morphologies here from uh, those S or inverse S type objects to uh, 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 morphologies to those more compact uh, morphologies where you see only the central source. The chemistry of this object is very complicated. I won't go into details today, but it seems to indicate uh, that we're dealing with a shock chemistry because we, the, especially those complex molecules like methanol, are really hard to uh, produce on time scales of a few hundred years. Uh, we, know of, we know that in, this, in the stellar medium, uh, methanol forms on ices, but it takes time and it takes high densities. Uh, uh, so it requires physical and chemical conditions that were unlikely to be fulfilled during and after the merger in uh, CK Vulpecula. So this is a very interesting uh, case for astrochemistry in shops. But those ALMA maps allow us also to map precisely the uh, location of molecular gas in uh, CK Vulpecula. And it seems that there is a difference between neutral atoms and atomic uh, material. Here I'm showing you some reconstruction plots showing the distribution of ions. You can see it's very complicated. It consists of several structures. Here is a 3D simulation where it shows even maybe uh, more uh, pronounced that 
uh, the structure is really, really complicated. It was, couldn't be formed in just a single uh, ejection uh, because uh, at the same time, although it looks irregular, there is some point symmetry between the northern and southern stars. So we think it was rather formed by multiple ejections or jet-like ejections uh, with changing orientation, so position angle and uh, uh, inclination. Uh, so our working hypothesis is that some of the material that was ejected during the merger come back to the system that is still there or a star that is still there interacts with the star and is being ejected at different position angle or at different orientation. So this guy is still kicking. We think that there may be still some interaction and this is where the shocks come from because there is still, there is still a lot of activity in this object. Unfortunately, we cannot observe it directly because uh, again, we're looking at an object that obscured by a thick torus that is seen edge on. So the spectrum that I showed you a moment ago was complex uh, because of the multiple molecules that we observed there, but also it's complex because we observe many isotopic forms of each of those molecules. And from that, we can uh, constrain the isotopic composition of the remnant. And the isotopic composition is very, very weird. Uh, you can see that the CNO elements are observed at very bizarre ratios that are unlike uh, other uh, in uh, any other object. So those seem to indicate that the gas with you, that we observe was processed in the CNO cycles and partial helium burning. But the most surprising was the observation of the aluminum 26 isotope, uh, which we observed through uh, emission lines of aluminum fluoride. This detection was announced a few uh, years ago and uh, there was pretty solid detection with four different spectral features. And uh, uh, we, you can consider this as the first detection of a radioactive molecule in space. Of course, we knew about radioactive nuclei, but this is the first one that was observed through uh, molecular transitions. The uh, aluminum fluoride containing uh, aluminum 26 is mostly concentrated in the central part of the, of the nebula. And it tells us a very interesting story about this star because there is not many stars that can produce uh, 26 aluminum. Uh, one of the group of stars that are considered as 26 aluminum producers are massive stars, uh, which a uh, massive progenitor is uh, excluded for CK vulpecula based on its luminosity and other properties. So we were left with scenarios where uh, a low mass star produced 26 aluminum. And the only thing that we, uh, uh, the only scenario that seems to be plausible for the source is that uh, uh, CK Vulpecula in the moment of eruption was a red giant star with a well-developed helium core. In those stars, stellar evolution models show that there is a layer rich in aluminum, including 26 aluminum, uh, that never, in normal stars, in normal giants, that, that aluminum never gets to the surface of the star and never gets dispersed. But if you smash another star into a red giant like this, you can provide extra mixing or even uh, disperse uh, material that is clo very close to the, to the core and, uh, um, uh, and transfer it to the uh, circumstellar medium. And this is what we think happened in CK Vulpecula. So the observation tells us that it was a red giant and the, the, the merger was pretty violent to expose those uh, guts of the star. The observation of 26 aluminum was also interesting in the context of uh, chemical evolution of our galaxy because uh, as uh, you may know that uh, isotope of 26 aluminum decays into magnesium producing a very famous uh, line at 1.8 mega electron volts. That emission was mapped throughout the galaxy. The strongest emission is in the galactic plane, but the telescopes that are sensitive to this line don't have very good angular resolution. So we never identified any individual source that would, would produce, actively produce 26 aluminum. The total mass of 26 aluminum in our galaxy is estimated to be about two solar masses. So uh, how do we, uh, uh, how can we detect the, the, those sources uh, in other, using other techniques? The case of CK Vulpecula shows that we can use ALMA 
to search for uh, uh, molecules containing 26 aluminum and maybe identify sources that are actively producing uh, uh, 26 aluminum. Uh, are those red novi or red novi related objects? It seems that it's very unlikely because the mass that we estimate, the mass of 26 aluminum uh, in uh, Siki Vulpecu is pretty low. Uh, this coupled with the low occurrence of stellar mergers in galaxies says that uh, red novi are not a, a viable source of the 26 aluminum that we observe in the galaxy. And by the way, the um, uh, frequency of stellar mergers in a galaxy like ours is of about two events per decade. So these are very rare uh, events, but still more uh, frequent than supernovae. So with this example, I would like to leave you and uh, just uh, let me summarize briefly what I have told you. I hope uh, uh, you realize now that we can observe stellar mergers happening in real time and we can study what's left after the merger, but for that you need a uh, very uh, 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 high angular resolution, preferentially uh, achievable with interferometers. And from this we're starting to learn something about the physics of why and how uh, 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 stars merge. On the way, we also uh, learn other uh, uh, bizarre phenomena like uh, the strange astrochemistry or dust formation in explosive objects. We see strange interaction between uh, eruptive ejecta with a companion star um, and we also uh, uh, study the uh, elemental and isotopic anomalies uh, in red novi which may be important in the context of uh, the galactic chemistry and uh, I didn't say much about this today but also uh, we think that the uh, uh, physics of uh, stellar mergers uh, uh, can be related to the formation of uh, bipolar planetary nebulae where a uh, common envelope is also involved. And with those, uh, with this summary, I thank you for your attention and uh, re I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. So uh, if anyone has a question, please right in the chat, uh, Abby. Hello, uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I had a question about um, these kind of disks that you see in the very central regions. I was wondering if from your modeling you have any idea as to the lifetime that these disks would exist for, whether they are like long-lived, like they are for protoplanetary or for, for protostars rather? Uh, no, I mean, from the observations, we, of course, we have a time scale of ten decades. And in this one case, if you believe it was a merger, that's 300 years. So observations do not tell us much about the uh, 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 lifetime of those disks. And we don't know enough about them so far to, be, to tell how long it will take to disperse them or, or get rid of them. Uh, but uh, the, the simulations, on the other hand, when they focus on the uh, merger uh, event, they have also uh, time scales that go up to a few hundred days after the merger. So no one ever actually tried to uh, model the evolution of the system uh, thousands of uh, tens of thousands of years ahead. So I'm, unfortunately, I'm not able to give you any precise answer. I guess the that's a big question mark still. Okay, um, also sorry, just related to the, that as well. You said that you wonder whether there is some interaction, like you wonder if the subsequent ejections are related to um, material being fed in. So like, do you think that this, this could then be accreting onto these, the, st the merged star? Yeah, that exactly, this is our working hypothesis. So you, you must know, you should know that actually we expect mergers to happen uh, frequently in triple systems. Uh, uh, one of the channels would be the Kozai leadoff effect. So in a post-merger uh, remnant, we can expect binaries. So uh, from a triple system, you, you are left with a, a binary. So uh, as in the case of V3 monocerotis, where, where it's uh, most straightforward. But if you have a tighter, bi tighter binary, some of the merger ejecta may fall down on the companion and the velocities that we observe in the molecular uh, uh, molecular material will be consistent with accretion on the companion uh, that is a main sequence star, low mass main sequence star. So that's one of the possibilities here. 
that it's still actively uh, accreting and the accretion is associated with uh, highly collimated jets. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Tomek. Yes, hi, uh, thanks. It was really, really uh, impressive results. Um, I have many questions, but the one that I chose to ask is, uh, you started your talk by saying that uh, textbooks tell us that these events should be rare. And that, yeah, so it, 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 it implies that you, uh, that it seems like we observe them more often than one, what we would expect. Is that, is this correct? Absolutely, yes. I mean, um, I remember very clearly being a student and reading the Frank Shu uh, textbook saying that we, we can never observe stellar mergers happening, even in uh, merging galaxies. That's very unlikely. Okay, because I wanted to ask, like, because for, for, for massive stars, we have, there are predictions. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, the paradigm shift over time. Yeah, I'm talking, I'm very old, you know, so I'm talking about uh, textbooks that were there 20, 30 years ago. Okay, so is it still correct that the observed rates are much higher than uh, what yeah. is currently predicted by... Yeah, 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 I, I think the, the estimates were uh, very off, and I think we just, over the last decades, we started to be interested in binary stars, not single stars, and we realized that the interactions are more, more important and more common. Of course, they are much, much more important for uh, massive stars, and this is a big result of the last years. So uh, in terms of frequency, we're still very, very much in the dark. Uh, it is, as you can see, we have only five cases in the last, uh, well, five cases in the last 300 years that we know of in our galaxy. And people use this small sample to uh, uh, make some statistics about those events. We also uh, refer to the extragalactic events, but uh, the estimates are very, very hard. You can use very sophisticated Bayesian techniques, but the, the, the thing is that we, uh, we don't know what is the frequency of those events. Okay. Well, thank you. Julia had a question. Yes. Hi, thanks a lot for the talk. It was very interesting. And actually, I also have a question following the lines of massive stars, because recently there was this paper uh, predicting that at least for massive stars, mergers are uh, magnetic. And th mm -hmm. this breaks the rotation, because I, in, in one yes. of your first mm -hmm. slides, you mentioned BE stars as well, so rapidly uh, rotating stars as merger project products. I was wondering what is your opinion on, on the magnetic field and actually the breaking down of the rapid rotation? Yes, yes. So the, the work of Fabian Schneider and his collaborators is excellent. This is beautiful work. Uh, but uh, the, the main object that they studied that they announced in nature was for a very massive star. So here the most massive object we consider is eight solar masses. It's a different regime. But again, uh, going through this simple train of thoughts that if you have a merger, you end up with a, a rapidly rotating star. Rapidly rotating star means there is magnetic fields. And uh, therefore, people propose that merger products should be very magnetic. And uh, uh, now addressing this question with red novi, we try to observe it in x-rays and in, in, uh, in radio. But nothing so far is conclusive to say that there is, um, there is or there is not a strong magnetic field. There's simply, we don't have good tools uh, in this kind of environment to tell whether the star is really magnetic. It, it of course goes down to the nature of the spectra, even at high resolution, the, the spectra are very complex. Uh, you cannot use the techniques that are used in uh, other, uh, uh, for other stars to investigate the magnetic field. But I hope we'll eventually, we will eventually find, find it out for Red Novi. As for the massive stars, uh, the, the, yeah, this is not my domain, but uh, uh, those the theoretical works are very exciting and uh, refreshing. All right, thanks. Thais, I had a question. Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering, going back to the uh, ejector and the multiple ejections that you were talking about, do the different eruptions have different energies and hence different velocities? Is that something you can see in the data or is it not quite that clear? 
uh, no, it's not that clear. This was the, the simulation I showed you was an interpretation because uh, there is degeneracy about the inclination and the velocity field. So you either assume simple velocity field and then you get the inclination or the other way around. Of course, there is no way to break this, uh, uh, break this uh, degeneracy in uh, complex structures like those we observe. So, um, it, uh, I, to be honest, I think both are possible, that both the, the velocities are changing and the orientation. And uh, also from the interaction from, from the distribution of ions with respect to uh, neutral molecules, we can say that there is really a lot of, um, uh, uh, there is a range of physical conditions within the nebula which, which would suggest different velocities. Uh, so there, there are parts of the material that are smashing into each other, and for that you need changes in velocity too, I would say. Uh, yes, but okay. I'm even physically hand-waving, because <laughs> this is a very, observationally, it's very difficult to, to tell anything for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is Jacques. Yeah, thanks for, for this very interesting uh... Uh, talk. I have just a follow-up question on, on Julia's question, actually, because you said that you have collimated jets, that you observed them. So isn't it a hint for a magnetic field? Well, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, you got me. So I guess that's the assumption that uh, for to generate collimated jets, you need magnetic fields, but I am definitely not an expert in magnetohydrodynamics. And if I understand correctly, the current state of affairs, no one was ever able to uh, generate a jet in a simulation with or without magnetic fields. So, um, uh, yeah, but it's again an indirect evidence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, probably what people would like to see is some kind of Zeeman effect measurement or um, something that is, well, uh, where we, as, as you probably are aware, that measuring the magnetic fields is difficult in any object. Yeah. Okay, and, and also for the, for the disk, for the stability of the disks, uh, mm -hmm. do you measure the uh, Keplerian rotation? Or? No. You know, we never that, so those structures that I have shown so far, they are really, really large. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the emission lines that I showed you, they mostly showed the bipolar, like, uh, outflow above the disk. We don't have any spectral signatures of the disks, not mentioning the parts of the disk that are disks that are close to the star. Mm. So for instance, now we are investigating in for the uh, CK Gulpecula, which I'm showing here on the slide here. Um, we are trying to reconstruct the SCD uh, precisely to be able to tell whether there is an inner hole or not that you can do with SCD. But uh, it, it, uh, we are not able to tell much about the kinematics of those disks. In, in CK Gulpecula, there are molecules that are only in this central region and the, the kinematics is very very complicated it's like a combination of a uh, disk that is expanding and rotating but it's also irregular it's not a beautiful uh, fully filled with azimuthal angle disk it's it seems like it's broken in some parts and then it's difficult to tell what is the actual structure both kinematically and spatially okay thanks Next is Pablo. Uh, hi, Tomek. Sorry, hi. To, I further want to dig into the magnetic field. Um, okay, go, go. So it's, if I think about a main sequence magnetic star, so I think in something tens of solar radii, kilogauss fields. Um, if more or less they would originate from these sort of systems, they would have more or less at this stage, the star is much more bloated, thinking 100 solar radii or so. Mm -hmm. And just from flux conservation of magnetic field, that would mean that an order of magnitude increase in radius means uh, two orders of magnitude uh, mm -hmm. lower magnetic field strengths. So sort of the targets you would be aiming more or less for Siemens splitting would be of fields of 10 gauss or so. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that would be actually feasible and also yeah. isn't just the star in the center of the score. 
Right, yeah, yeah, you, you're raising an excellent point. And the fact that we are observing those objects tens of years after the eruption, we're still observing a bloated star that is contracting, as I showed you for a V3 mon, we see it directly. So it's, it's, it's gonna be difficult to measure magnetic fields and also angular momentum or rotation of the star because it's so huge that it, it may be difficult to also for the angular momentum budget to say uh, whether it's rapidly rotating or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the questions related to mergers uh, are, are easier to answer probably those hundreds of thousands of years after the merger. But in these cases, you are never sure whether it was really a merger. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how to tackle this. So how long would you, do you expect this nebula to survive? More or less, can we expect to see some systems where there's still the nebula and more or less the, the red yeah, yeah. Actually, star in the middle? Actually, I have a paper on AstroPH about this. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm expecting that um, some of the preplanetary nebulae, uh, you, you can see here that this looks like a planetary nebula or preplanetary nebula. If you didn't know much about the central source, you could easily classify it as a post-AGB or a planetary nebula. Uh, uh, because usually we don't have distances to those guys, right? So if you see morphology like this, you assume it was a, a post-AGB star with a luminosity of 10 power 4. Uh, but this object uh, has a much lower luminosity of about 16 uh, solar luminosities at the moment. So definitely it's very different than uh, protoplanetary nebulae. And I just suggested that maybe we should have a look at the uh, protoplanetary nebulae with low luminosity, uh, whether uh, after revising the distances to those objects, uh, we get something like CK Vulpecula. But of course, CK Vulpecula is also a very unusual uh, when you look at the chemical abundances of those strange isotopes, and it's clear a sign that something weird happened there, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pablo. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? Uh, if not, I will ask one. Uh, you said that the V838 mon is probably a merger of a, a B type star with a pre main sequence star. Uh, mm -hmm. In that case, what would cause the orbits to spiral in? Because I well, actually, understand this, it for yeah. uh, an evolved star. Uh, well, I, I'm, of course, I will avoid direct answers, so I will tell you uh, some other things. <laughs> for instance, that it, is, it has been expected that uh, in dense fields, so objects that are in dense clusters, uh, through the dyna dynamical interaction, you expect mergers, especially in the center, uh, in the center of those clusters, so that has been predicted. Uh, so dense fields, uh, dynamical interaction can lead to mergers. But also in terms of, uh, for, if we're talking about protoplanetary stars, uh, proto, uh, proto, sorry, proto, proto stars, they still have disks, uh, especially the low mass stars. And the disks, I, if, from what I read, uh, can also um, uh, lead to mergers. Uh, so, I mean, can lead to some interactions that eventually lead to mergers. And the one case that is now very popular in this context, uh, let me get to the second slide, uh, uh, is, is Orion KL, right? This is uh, where we, you also have an object, so you see, you see those uh, eight solar mass stars running away in different directions, and you see this uh, nebula whose uh, kinematical center is at the location where those stars probably met a few years, a hundred years ago, uh, 300 years ago. Uh, uh, and then one of those objects, which is called Source I, uh, which is also an eight solar mass star, is probably a product of a merger or a, a, a product that was, um, uh, uh, or, or, or a star that strongly interacted with other stars. So uh, if you read, read about uh, the case of uh, Orion Molecular Cloud 1 or the Source I, uh, you, you, you will find references to uh, theoreticians who predicted that those young systems should interact strongly and possibly also uh, uh, cause mergers. Okay, thank you. Uh, any last questions from anyone?
if not, we will leave the seminar there. Thank you very much, Thomas. And we will reconvene for the, the discussion in about 